Welcome to the Senate. And as you all know, Palpatine is the Senate. It's a vote of no confidence. I'm Andrew Fantasia, and I'm joined, as always, in the Senate by somebody who hasn't, uh, I haven't been in the Senate with for a long, long time, because I haven't just been here in Coruscant for a long, long time, Mr. Rod McDonald. Hello, Mr. Rod McDonald. Yeah, I've been in the uh, quarantine room in the Senate, so I've just been stuck in there for uh, qu quite a long time. I mean, I, I think we all know what quarantine feels like nowadays, and uh, yeah, it's uh, it's it's getting on my nerves a little bit. I don't know about you guys, but that's how it's uh, that's how I'm feeling. If we all had floating pods like the senators in Star Wars do, it'd be a lot easier to quarantine. Somebody gets within six feet of you, you're just like, nope, and you pod away. Pod is a verb now. Yeah. No, yeah, you could just like uh, put a put like an anti tractor beam, like pushing everything away, trying to get everybody away. <laughs> but the purpose of today is to not push people away. Is we actually want to embrace people, we want to love them, we want to give them our germs today, Rob, because it's the two hundredth uh, Rebel Scum podcast episode. It's a big to do. Yeah, we're ah, oh, this is so exciting. I'm very happy for James and Brock for making it this far. You and I both told them on day one, you're never going to make it past five episodes because we were cynical jerks. And they were like, oh, yeah, we'll show you. And they showed us and now we're eating our words. Uh, so we've decided to hold a vote of no confidence once again, like old times sake. Because we want to celebrate this special occasion. It's the 200th episode. Rob, what are we voting with no confidence against slash for today? So I believe the, uh, the topic at hand basically is um, who should rule Mandalore? I believe it should be a case. And I think we got two very worthy contenders ab about who should rule Mandalore. Yes, we do. We have the contender in this corner in the, the red corner, I'll say, because your hair is red, Miss Bo-Katan Kreese. And in the blue corner, Mr. Din, the Mandalorian, Jaren himself. Who are you throwing your vote with? My vote, I mean, I got to stick with my man here, and it is, of course, Din Jaren. That's the guy. That's the guy who should be ruling Mandalore. And then, of course, you're on the side of Bo-Katan. So would you like to get me, uh, would you like me to start this thing off here? Andrew, Absolutely. Tell me, tell me why you're rocking the vote for Din. Yeah, you know what? Uh, I mean, he's the one holding the dark saber right now, and uh, I feel like uh, you know we need change, Andrew. We need change. Mandalore's had some big problems in its past. I mean, I don't know if you've heard, but yeah, the, it, Mandalore's not hasn't had the most colorful and nice of pasts. We're not talking about something like you know, uh, like very like. Um, desolate like Tatooine like you know Tatooine has its own problems but you know Mandalore's been uh, ravaged a little bit let's say by war times and I think it's time to have a change I think it's time for Din Djarin to be the one to take over Mandalore and to be its rightful ruler Ooh, so you basically want to make Mandalore great again that's what you're saying yeah mag uh, picture this with a mega hat that's what it's gonna be <laughs> No, let's let's leave that part out of it. I mean, I think his time is done. But anyway, go go for it. Tell me why Bo-Katan is uh, number one. Well, I, I had to go with Bo-Katan Kreese. Um, I'm all about the House of Kreese, uh, as Madonna would say. I am crazy for you. Crazy for you. Ah. I actually wrote that song. Fun fact. Madonna likes to say it was her. It wasn't. That's a lie, too. I didn't write it. Bo and we just, got a, we just got a YouTube strike, I think, as well. For, yeah, just for that we story. just did. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah we, lost, we lost 75 subscribers, which means we are now in the negative, but that's okay. Uh, Bo-Katan and Kreese is um, the rightful heir. Uh, she or heiress, I don't know. I don't know the right word. But she is uh, essentially King Arthur in the fact that there is this sword that whoever pulls it gets to be the ruler and it belongs to her. Now, Mandalorian acquired it. Yes, he did. Din Djarin acquired that sword through combat. But the fact of the matter is he does not know how to rule a planet. She knows how to... She is a natural-born leader. She's never had the opportunity to really lead Mandalore. At least not what we've seen. But she has the army behind her. The Mandalorian, what, what's left of the Mandalorian army is behind her. And the bloodline 
and we'll get more into the bloodline later, but the bloodline is a very key important factor when it comes to Mandalorian culture because they're all about clans. So I think that there's just so much weight in her favor to sit down on that throne and be like, yo, you're all going to be crazy for me because I'm the queen of the jungle, whatever Mandalorian calls itself these days. It's it's funny that you brought up about how like she hasn't really gotten a chance to really rule Mandalore, but it's like if you look at the back backstory, she's kind of had like two separate terms of ruling Mandalore herself. Like it's after the whole Maul situation gets dealt with, she basically gets appointed and she's like, you know, the semi ruler of Mandalore before the Empire comes, takes over, and then Gar Saxon basically takes over. And then after that, everything's resolved there. It's just, it's um, Sabine Wren who who dethrones him and basically hands over the uh, the dark saber over back over to Bo Katan. So again, there's another uh, ruling right there. And then at some point afterwards, she loses it to um, Moff Gideon. So she's kind of you know had her chance a little bit. I feel like she's she's gotten no chance, and maybe you know outside factors have come in and taken it away from her a little bit. But it's like. To me, the fact of the matter is that it's like, yeah, we got things like Death Watch and d different clans like Pre, Pre Vizsla, Clan Vizsla, um, basically all fighting amongst each other type of thing. But meanwhile, you got Din Djarin over here, just on the side. He's a foundling. He's, you know, not really involved with everything as much as it is. Yeah, he was he was basically a children of the watch. He was he was brought up by Death Watch. And to me, he's the one that's kind of perfectly situated in the middle of this all. Because it's like there's so much going on between Death Watch and between Bo-Katan's Bo clan and the, their their group of Mandalorians that it's like if anybody's gonna bring these two clans together, I feel like it's the guy that's you know learning a little bit on the other side in season two. Din Djarin starting to learn about them and then learn a little bit more in season three from Bo-Katan about it all. And it's like if anybody's gonna broach a piece between these clans, I feel like it's the guy that's stuck in the middle with you. <laughs> hmm. you're right uh bo has had she's she's had two non-consecutive rulings she's she's the grover cleveland of mandalore but uh she you know they both times it was swept out from under her unfairly and unjustly um i think that death watch is an interesting point to bring up because you know if, I, if i'm sitting here on election day and i'm looking at bo -Katan and i'm looking at Din Djarin, and I'm like, who am I going to elect to be ruler of Mandalore? Is it going to be the lady who led our armies to freedom by, you know, standing up to the Empire and everybody who tried to take down our planet, or the guy who basically lives with Mandalorian Al-Qaeda? So, which one am I going to put my vote with? And I have to go with the one who has proven that the planet and the people of Mandalore come first to her. I believe that there is so much love that she has for her people. And I don't think Din Djarin has that. I think he has love for his clan, whatever their clan calls themselves. I don't even remember if they have a name when he's down there on Navarro with the armor. I think they're just like, we're the clan, whatever. Yeah, they just call themselves Mandalorians, it seems like. That's yeah, like just, the, just the Mandalorians. And I think that there is love within that group. But I don't feel like... You know, I feel like if Din Djarin was to travel to some back, like if he was just to go to Jakku and go to a, a tavern in Jakku and meet a Mandalorian who's not from his clan, I feel like his first instinct would be to fight them. Bo-Katan's first instinct would be like, hey, how are you? Are you okay? Where's your family? What house did you come from? Did you, you know, were you there during the purge or what have you? And I think that all has roots in the fact that her sister Satine was this sort of glue that held Mandalore together. She refused to take part in the Clone Wars. She kept them away from war. And even though Bo-Katan and Satine didn't always see eye to eye, I think Bo-Katan appreciated the fact that there was so much peace, even if it was just for a little bit, a tiny smidgen of time, because of Satine's actions. And she's going to, I think she has learned at this point where we meet her in the Mandalorian season two, I think Bo-Katan has learned from the mistakes she made back during the Clone Wars. And now she's a wiser person because she's taken the best elements of herself, the best elements of her older sister, RIP. And she's squished that all together into the ultimate Mandalorian ruler. 
And when she has had those two non-consecutive terms in office, she hasn't had that power under her belt yet. She hasn't been, for lack of a better word, the Jedi Master equivalent of a ruler. She's just been running things as a Padawan. Uh, but now she is, you know, Octo Luke Skywalker coming into his own and realizing that he can be the best Jedi he can be, even if he doesn't set foot off Octo. I think she's at that stage now. Whereas Din Djarin, God bless him, he's a good man, but he's still learning. And I think right now he's too lost without Grogu. And the last thing you want to do is give him a planet and a people to take care of and make his responsibility. Yeah, see, I starting to wrap this thing up a little bit, but in my eyes, like, you know, you're mentioning how it's like, you know, he's lost a little bit now. I, I consider him not necessarily lost. It's just that, you know, that has been his mission. Dealing with Rogu, that has been his mission. Everything else was just off the side. Like, he was uninterested in anything else. It was just about that. Now his his plate is actually free a little bit. He's free to, like, you know, um, uh, start dealing some of the stuff that's been brought up to him recently. And, I mean, you mentioned how it's, like, you're unsure about how he would react about seeing somebody that's not a part of his clan. I mean, he he met Bo-Katan in, in Season 2. He he met her. He They were a little hostile at first, but ultimately it grew, and clearly he, he, uh, he cared enough about her to actually go to her for help. Right, like to get Grogu back, it's like he trusted her enough. Who somebody's not a part of his plan, that's not a part of Death Watch. Who he doesn't consider a true Mandalorian. He was, he was, he felt it enough to go to her and ask her for help, and you know, create a unity between those two, right? A little bit, and I feel like that unity is what's missing from a little bit, from Satine to Bo-Katan to whatever, right? Because even when Satine was around, you had Previsla off on the side and it's like, oh, he's, they're not real Mandalorians. They can stay on this moon over there, right? Like that, that's what they thought about Vizsla. And then you had this uprising, right? That was coming up to, to take it back because they thought it's like, oh, you're pushing us downward. Come back and take it all from me, right? And with Bo-Katan, even when she takes over after Maul's rule, it's like you had uh, Gar Saxon who was coming up and basically, you know, created an alliance with the Empire to take over Mandalore again. And it's a case where it's like, yeah, she could go and take it back again, but it's like De- Death Watch will still be around. They'll be still around, to, and they'll they'll rise up again. They'll they'll try to take it from her again. The ultimate way to fix this entire thing is to combine those two together. I feel like it's the guy that yeah was was again raised to be part of Death Watch, raised to be part of this you know rebel group, like you know this this splinter cell of of Mandalorians. But it's ultimately him who's starting to realize what how the other Mandalorians work and how they, you know, how they see things. And I'm sure we'll get to see that in, 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 in season three. Uh, it's that type of a guy that can finally not just, you know, rule Mandalore peacefully, like, you know, how Satine did and how Bo-Katan wanted to, and perhaps how she thinks she can, but to finally put those two parts together and say, you we are both Mandalorians. Death Watch is Mandalorians, Clan Vizsla are Mandalorians, and so are... Uh, Bo-Katan's group. So is uh, Satine's group of Mandalorians. We're all Mandalorians and we're going to unite this thing together and, you know, maybe we can finally grow a plant on this planet. Anyway, that's my uh, that's my point of view. Again, co- close it off there, Andrew. Uh, in closing, I got to say, I think that in time, in, in a few years' time, Din Djarin will have the mental fortitude to be able to be a leader. Uh, because being a parent or guardian to one being is a much different thing from being a leader to many people. And I think that, yes, he is now, you know, in honor, in name, a Mandalorian. Sure, he's a foundling. We don't know what planet he's originally from. Doesn't matter. He's a Mandalorian now. But I think his loyalties in his heart of hearts as a Mandalorian, when he thinks of himself as a Mandalorian, he thinks of, again, his little enclave of, of homies. And all those little homies and our armorer friend, who, by the way, I'm putting money down. The armorer is coming back in season three. Um, she has to. But that <laughs> she has to. Yeah. Um, that little group of homies is where his heart is. And I think that the Mandalorian people, the vast majority, I can't even remember how many planets are part of the Mandalore consortium. I think it's more than just the planet Mandalore. I'm sure there's a few others. I don't I think all those people are so far removed from him they're not even on his radar 
His whole pocket is this offshoot of Death Watch. And Death Watch, as we've known them in the, the Gar Saxon and uh, pre Vizsla days, are not the most caring people. They don't have the best interests of the people of Mandalore. They have the best interests of themselves. They were power hungry. They were greedy. They wanted to return Mandalore to the way of the warrior. They wanted to fight. And I believe that the Din Djarin that we met at the beginning of The Mandalorian is along that same vein. Now he's been softened by Grogu. He's been made to be a person who's more empathetic and willing to use diplomacy rather than aggressive negotiations. But he still needs to wean his way. He's got to wash Death Watch out of his bloodstream because that is still what's fueling him. And until he can do that, I wouldn't put him in charge of a damn thing, especially if there's any missiles on any planets. Uh, I'm not giving him the keys to those missiles yet. So I am still uh, polishing off the throne and making sure it is comfy and clean and secure for when Bo-Katan puts her butt in it and starts ruling the planet. Because uh, it is a third term that has been long earned. Fair enough. Uh, I mean, uh, yeah, I think we I think we need a vote for this. So I think we need properly, you know, put this in Twitter or whatever, set up the vote. And then when I'm up four to three, we stop the count. OK, that's how it's going to work. Um, but I think we're uh, we're in for a treat either way. Whoever rules Mandalore, even though it is going to be Bo-Katan. Creed, we'll see, buddy. We'll see. I'm, cr- <laughs> I'm crazy for you. Anyway, that has been. A vote of no confidence, a long time coming. Rob, it is such a pleasure to vote with no confidence alongside you once again. And of course, back to Brock and James. Happy 200th episode, guys. You only got this far because of Rob and I. Let's be real. Hey, scumbags. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to give us a thumbs up on our video. As always, please subscribe to our YouTube channel, Rebel Scum Podcast, for all the latest videos.